Hi guys, welcome. So today I am answering your questions. So I put it out there, what would you like to know about European instruments? You guys asked some fantastic questions. So Kawai asked the first questions, what are the ancestors of the violin? And thank you for your kind comment. I'm thankful you had a safe trip, Olaf. It's good to go on an adventure. I hope this next year will be peaceful for you and your family. So do I. Thank you. P.S. Your videos help my mind slow down during moments of high anxiety and depression. I try and serve the string community, but sometimes you find out that you're actually serving in a, in a very different way than you think. So I appreciate that feedback. That's, that's really lovely. I truly appreciate the calm energy. I'm hoping to grow as a person, aren't we all? That's yeah. As an artist this year, my first task is to be kinder to myself. Here's a gentle reminder to please be kind to yourself too. Thank you for being you. I really appreciate that, Kawhi. Thank you. Yes, that's right. We have to all be kind to ourselves. And for a lot of people, that is actually doing something that you love doing, uh, like playing your instrument. But back to the question, the ancestors of the violin. So there's quite a few. So they always say they say that the ancestors of the violin came from the east to the west. So they they were bowed instruments throughout the Middle East for a very long time, and also into China. There's the instrument, the erhu, that people play. It's just a one-stringed instrument. They there are some. Uh, I think they may. There's also some African stringed instruments. There were some other ancient instruments in Persia, and then uh, there's an instrument called the rebec, which I believe was a three-stringed fiddle that was used quite a lot throughout the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages. And uh, then the viol de gamba kind of started as an instrument. And then there's some paintings of a violin-like instrument uh, with a German guy called Diefenburger, which uh, who was a lute maker, and then also around the time of Amati, there was a painter that uh, that painted a violin-like instrument into their painting. So they attribute the origins of the violin to the Amati family, Niccolo Amati. Uh, so the oldest existing instruments, I believe, are Amati instruments. Uh, or oldest known existing instruments. So, you know, it, if you live in Italy and come from Cremona, people quite often say, yes, that's where instruments originated. Uh, others think, you know, there's theories that they originated in Germany and, and other places. Uh, hundred, Obviously, we don't know 100%, but the most plausible is actually that the instrument originated in Cremona. You know, un until I have concrete proof, I'm not going to say <laughs> exactly. But the ancestors were some older fiddle-like instruments, and they, they were actually being used in, like, Celtic music. There was instruments being used in the Middle East. Uh, different tuning, but uh, but once a violin came along, it actually replaced a lot of the instruments. The, the north of India, that culture had a stringed instrument for a very long time. You know, there's not a clear line that we can see or that's written down. Welcome home, Olaf. Glad you're back. What really separated the great Italian makers of their instruments from one another? How were Stradivarius and Guarnerius different? What distinguishes instruments from the Venetian and the Cremonese school, in your opinion? Okay, so this is a difficult one because it gets quite technical. The Cremonese makers worked around an, an internal form and uh, and and violin making kind of spread so there was there was a lot of similarities in the way instruments were made but there were also subtle differences subtle differences obviously were the shapes that they used uh, so slight differences there um, Stradivarius, for example, like if you look at Stradivarius and Guarnerius, Stradivarius was very systematic. He created systems. If you look at my video about the Cremona Violin Making Museum, he had a template for absolutely everything. 
unbelievable. Like, he was so organised. And I joked that it was a bit like, you know, Macca's, McDonald's, um, because, you know, they they created a system for making one burger like the other. And, uh, you know, but, but these kinds of systems for doing things actually help people to duplicate something exactly. You know, most Stradivarius instruments were made after he was uh, in his 50s. So he was born in 1644 and died in 1737. And most instruments were made after the 1700s, which means he was older than 56 years. And also, you, you'd think back then they didn't really have glasses. Uh, they may have had magnifying glasses, but not glasses. So I think that he oversaw a lot of the making process in his older age. He lived to a ripe age of 93 years. So, um, you know, that's quite a long, long time, especially in the 1700s where life expectancy was much shorter. And yeah, so he had a very clean, systematic way of making instruments, very clean, sharp edges. Everything was finished very very closely, whereas Gunnerius had a bit more of a free-flowing style. He was a little bit, a bit more, you know, a little bit wilder. He was a little bit less organized. He probably made a lot of his own instruments. That's why there's a lot less there, whereas Stradivarius had his sons working for him, as well as some other makers. Yes, yeah, so, so the clean edges, you can see the shapes are very different. Uh, then the different areas, um, uh, you know, each each area kind of had their individual style. And, and you kind of just got to study the style of one maker, uh, uh, each maker, to really see the difference. So there would be differences in the F-holes, the way the F-holes were carved. For example, um, so there's this, uh, the scoop just in the F-hole here. That, that's made differently with each, uh, with each instrument. The, the kind of edge work, uh, the way the purfling inlaid, how close the purfling is to the edges, how the purfling ends right here. So in some instruments, it, it, it gets pulled into the tips. So there's lots and lots of little differences. It would probably take a whole video in its own right to explain all those differences. So I'm not going to do that here. Uh, okay. How much has the shape of the violin changed over time? Very little. So if you look at the shape of, say, an Amati violin, which was a very early violin, and, and instruments from now, there's not much in the, uh, uh, that has changed about the shape. Of course, each individual maker has their own style and their own shapes, but generally it hasn't changed so much. It's quite amazing, actually, that that would basically the basic shape of the instrument and the makeup is very similar to the way it was that many years ago. So what did change was the bass bar. So they've made the bass bar a bit stronger now than it used to be because they've put more pressure on the top plate. Also the neck has changed a little bit. Uh, the other thing that changed from the 1500s is the length of the neck in comparison to the body. The, the necks are now a little bit longer than they once used to be. Also, the neck angle has changed a little bit to allow for higher bridges and a bit more tension in the instrument, just, just to get a bigger sound. How do you recognize a French violin compared to a German violin compared to an Italian? Uh, experts seem to glance at an old violin and immediately say, this appears to be an early French violin. There's a big thing about experience. So years and years and years of experience and seeing thousands and thousands of instruments. You, you see a style and you immediately recognize it. How do you tell the distinguishing characteristics? You listen to the accent. So French instruments have a strong French accent. Italians have the strong Italian accent and the Germans. I, I will tell you all about the German violins. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I uh, yes, no, I, I've been wanting to make that joke for days. No, the real thing is that it's experience. Uh, I literally, you know, I've been doing this for well over 35 years. You know, after you've seen thousands of instruments, you, you can just tell straight away. And some instruments are just recurring. Yeah, so this, this is a very clear sort of a French style instrument from the late 1800s. 
has has very clear corners. There were some English makers that did something similar, but uh, it's quite clearly, I, I can tell just by the clean lines, and it's almost like they tried to copy the Messiah Stradivarius violin. So a lot of French violins look very similar to the Messiah Stradivarius violin. Italian makers, there's such a variance, it's amazing. Yeah, so this is an Italian violin made in Bologna, where I was just recently, in the early 1900s. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's so different to some other Italian instruments I've seen. And then German instruments, you've got the mass produced German instruments and I can usually tell them straight away because they made them a bit different to other instruments. They cut some corners so they dispense with the internal mold and they stuck the, the ribs together from the outside. So, so the ribs actually, the, the corners were a little bit longer so they could put clamps on the sides. But there are some German instruments that look like English instruments. So the earlier instruments, that they were kind of schools and, and styles that you could recognize uh, fairly easily. But now there are makers, you know, I mean, there are makers training all over the world. There are, you know, we've got, and here in Australia, we've got violin makers that were trained in Italy, Germany, France, England, here in Australia, lots of places around the world. So, so now the styles are even harder to see and recognize. So that's a bit of a vague answer, I understand, but it's it's a matter of experience. You just gotta look at thousands of instruments. Hi Olaf, I wonder about the shape of a sound post and circumferential size. Would it influence the sound of the violin? If we put in a rectangular one, or is there always a standard circular size in comparison with the ones in 1800 or do we need to make an experiment on this one? That sounds like an interesting idea. I did have a violin the other day with a viola sound post in it that was seven over seven millimeters in, in width. So sometimes we'll put a slightly thinner sound post in there to, um, to change the sound, but generally six mils to millimeters to six and a half millimeters. Uh, it does have a bit of an effect, but it would be it would be kind of fun to maybe experiment the square sound post especially that sounds interesting because I'm curious about that if uh, how much of that an effect that will have whether it matters if it's round or square hmm. interesting can I talk about the smaller pieces like the sound post how important is the shape and thickness so thickness, uh, you know, I, I usually use the standard thickness and I am um, between six and six and a half millimeters and it works really well for me. Uh, I quite often change the length. So um, if I need a bigger sound on an instrument, uh, I'll put a bit less tension. So I'll make a little bit shorter. Yeah, it's all about getting a really nice balance on the top plate. Uh, so yes, it definitely has an influence on the sound. Has there been a change in the bridge shape since the 1500s? Absolutely, it has totally changed. So the early violin bridges almost look a little bit like a cello bridge. They're a lot thicker at the top. Yeah, so definitely quite different. So they've changed quite a lot since the 1500s, but also the tension on the instruments changed a lot. The shape of the bow, it's definitely changed from a the Baroque style bow to the current bows. So this is a Baroque style bow. You can see the tip is very different to the tip of bows that got developed in the late 1700s. Also the bottom is very different. I'd like to know about the development of the bow, shape, hairs, resins, etc. The French bow maker taught really changed the shape of the bow to what it is now. Before they were the Baroque bows and then they, before that they had more and more of an arch. They almost looked a little bit like an archery bow. So it's quite amazing the development. What were some of the oldest violins that were preserved or taken care of over the years to last until today? Are they still playable? Uh, absolutely. Um, so there are Amati violins from the 1550s that are still playable. But yeah, they were definitely instruments from the mid to late 1500s that are still being used but some are starting to become a little bit difficult to play. Okay so this one's interesting. Uh, hi Olaf, in your trip to Cremona were you able to meet any uprising new makers, workshops, 
that have a nice future. There's a lot of competition around the world. Do you think the level of quality and competition in Cremona among modern makers is still the gold standard for the rest of the world? It's an interesting one. I mean, Cremona is a hotbed for um, violin makers. So you will get violin makers from all over the world. You know, there are American violin makers, uh, violin makers from Japan, Korea, China, um, Germany, England, France, just literally from all over the world, um, there, are, there are violin makers in Cremona. Not all of them actually learned in Cremona. So there is a multitude of different styles, different theories. So they're as different as other violin makers in the world. So I wouldn't necessarily say that Cremona is any kind of gold standard because there are so ma many makers in a small place are really working towards coming, you know, kind of being that center of violin making again. And, and, and it's actually quite amazing what they've achieved, especially in the last 20 to 30 years. But there are fantastic violin makers all around the world, you know, and, and, and there's no real standard anymore. Like you, you can get people in America that would train in England or Cremona. You can get people in Italy that would train in England. You can get German makers trained in Italy, Italian makers trained in Germany. And styles are just as varying all over the world. So there's not, you know, once upon a time, time there'd be a particular way of doing something in an area and you'd be able to tell for example I can always tell a violin made in the Mittenwald area before the early 1900s and even now actually the Mittenwald violin making school has a very particular style same actually with the Newark school of violin making in England another place that really heavily leans their instrument on the Messiah Stradivarius violin which is you know the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford so it's only a short trip away to, to actually look at it. Cremona is amazing because there are so many makers and you can look at the work of so many makers in one place but there are fantastic makers all over the world so you, you'll probably find some wonderful makers in Cremona and wonderful makers in other parts of the world and also some more average ones. So there you go I finally managed to answer your questions uh, I know it's taken about four months to edit the video together. Uh, I actually answered them a while ago, but we wanted to make sure that we actually have all the information on there for you. So I hope you liked it. There was, there was so many questions. We've actually divided the video into two videos. So this is part one and there will be part two. So there were just so many questions about European instruments. So look out for part two. It, it should be live very soon. So thanks so much for watching. Hope you liked the video. If you liked it, please hit the like button. It always helps me. Subscribe and hit the little bell and have a wonderful day and keep making beautiful music. Thanks for watching guys. See ya. Thank you.